This is episode 34 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Alyssa Holbrook. Alyssa, welcome to the show. Let's say hi, and I'm going to read your bio in right after. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Alyssa is a certified life coach through the Life Coach School and an advanced certified deep dive coach, which we'll get into. She helps investors build a $1 million real estate portfolio in six months by mastering their mind. We always talk about mindset here, so I love that. She's passionate about understanding the mind, becoming a better version of herself, and helping her clients create cash flow so they can live their ideal life. That's a pretty sweet bio. It, I mean... <laughs> Where did you start with real estate investing? Because I know it was early like me. Yeah. So I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I was homeschooled. So I had time on my hands and I had a very hard work ethic. And so I had saved up some money. And when I was 14 years old, I bought my first property. Wow. With, with the help of parents or kind of them helping you guide the way or you just are like, get out of my way. I'm going to do this. So my dad was helpful in that he helped me find the property. Yeah. And other than that, I did so much of it. Just, I remodeled it myself. I mean, there was so much that I did on my own, but definitely my dad was an incredible mentor. Yeah. 14 years old. Where did the money come from and how did you figure out how to get a deal at 14? Yeah. So I had saved up my money to buy a camera. And I thought it would cost about $300. And once I had that $300, dollar by dollar, right? I was earning it by selling flag pins, babysitting for neighbors, and filing at my dad's office. Very slow to accumulate the money. And so yeah. once I hit $1,000, I knew there's a way that my money could make money for me. Yeah. Like, I'm definitely going to do that. I didn't want to spend it on something and have it be gone. And so, uh, yeah, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and asked my dad, like, is it possible for me to buy a property? And he said, yes. And he found one for me. So that's that amazing. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, did it help to have a, a parent or parents who support that right away to say like my 14 year old's reading like a real estate investing book? Uh, that's a little crazy, but to, to be able to support that, I had the same type of support. So I think it's really important, but also again, for everybody else, you don't have to have that support to be successful, but we are fortunate that we did have parents who say like, yeah, you want to buy a house when you're 14, let's do this. Yeah, absolutely. It was unmatched. I feel like riding around, uh, my dad was a commercial appraiser. And so we would ride in his car and he would just teach me like, here's what a mortgage is. And here's how you buy a property. And just kind of all the things around real estate, like any questions that I had, but even questions I didn't know to ask, he would just educate me as I shadowed him at work and yeah. filed the papers. Yeah. So. Same as me. I think my dad was filling me with so much real estate information from five on that there was times where I was like, I really don't want to hear this. And then I like, as I got to be like 18 and I was owned properties before as well, but like at 18, when I started buying myself, I was like, I know a lot. <laughs> And yeah. I, I started to think like, you know, this is just the information that we give to our children. And one day they'll say the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah, totally true. I'm excited to be able to give that to my kids. They're, yeah. My oldest is 10. And so we already have conversations about that. Yeah. And so what, what was that first type of property and what did you end up doing with it? Yeah. So the very first one that I bought was a completely inoperable mobile home. It didn't work <laughs> awesome. at all. Yeah. <laughs> and... I, my parents gave me a loan of a thousand dollars, which was absolutely, I absolutely needed it yeah. and helped me find the person who had been doing work on my bedroom at home. We just sent him over there and he yeah. did some of the work. And so I paid them for his work and then I got a renter in and she was able to start paying and she was, I think she was being paid by the government, right? On retirement. Yeah. And so yeah. it was pretty steady income and I just saved that money until I had enough to buy the next one. And my dad had a friend who was a realtor who had a property that they hadn't really paid attention to. And this one was $2,000, I think, at that point. And so I bought one that was $2,000. And it, when my dad and I went to look at it, we opened the door and it was like a wall of bricks. It yeah. was the smell of cat urine. Yeah. Popular. I've seen it a lot. Smelled it yeah. a lot, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Um, one of the windows was broken. So the cats from the neighborhood in this mobile home park just lived in yeah. this property. So 
luckily my dad helped me find someone who could pull out the worst of it to not you know, yeah, yeah, that would have been especially it's not bad. good. But then I, as of this, by this time, I was sixteen, so I painted kills all over the floor, the wall, the ceiling, scrubbed the refrigerator with, you know, six month old milk, and I started laying carpet actually with a friend from the mobile home park. It was the mobile home park manager's daughter. Yeah, and she was like, "Oh, I can help you. I know how to lay carpet," and so. As this little 95 pound, 16 year old, I'm like hammering carpet in and, and just really saw this place go from the eyesore of the road of that particular complex yeah. to one of the very nice places on the block. And for me, I think that's what instilled my love of real estate so early on, because I love seeing how we really are making an impact in people's lives and we're transforming like no one really wants to take that on. So of yeah. course there's a financial benefit, but like we're making this place better. We're giving someone a place to live. And I loved that from day one. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing first that you were a 14 year old landlord, but that you eventually, that you right away, like I think most people who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Rich Dad, Poor Dad is obviously a book referenced a lot by a lot of our guests, but a lot of people read it later. So they're not activating mm -hmm. on the like kid portion that they were both, they were, you know, he's a kid in the story. <laughs> you know, you were a kid and you're really the first person I've, I've talked to who read that as a kid and applied it early. It's very, very interesting to be able to do it. And especially on a small scale, we don't hear people who these days can start with a 1000 or $2,000, you know, investment because things are crazy. But if you start with mobile home and move up from there, Obviously, we'll we'll get to your journey, but that it's uh, that's amazing. You must have had something inside of you that was attracted to real estate because once you started, you if you're you know doing carpet and all those things, it, you have the thing in you to to want to you know help, like you said, and transform spaces. Yeah, for sure. And I I also think back on I played the rich dad poor dad cash flow game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early on, and I do think there's something of this entrepreneurial spirit that shows through even way back then because I remember playing the game, and once I saw how fast it moved once you were out of the day to day rat race. Yeah. I like caught this vision of how big can I possibly go? Like, what am I capable of? And it wasn't really about just making enough. It was about like, could I do $200 million worth of real estate? Like even as a young child, there was this like, I wanted to know what my capacity was. I wanted to ride the edge of my capacity and like really see what was in me to create in this world, like in this lifetime, how big can I go? And I feel like that's kind of unique. And it's something where my people that I tend to coach with, like they tend to have that same experience or that same drive of like, um, we call it divine discontent sometimes. Yeah. The, the reaching for something that seems originally like outside of our comfort zone, but you have to reach out there to get it. I mean, it's yeah. out there. Uh, I think the belief that you can do more is what everybody needs to kind of get to levels that they didn't know uh, were there. So from those two first investments, eventually you kept investing and also uh, got licensed as an agent. You've been licensed for, I think you said 13 years now. So tell us about that journey, why you got licensed and now what your investment portfolio has been doing since those, the $1,000 and $2,000 <laughs> investment. And then we'll get into how you got into coaching as well. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I love it. So I, uh, after college, I was actually recruited. I was going to go to law school, but I was recruited to come work for a home builder. And I got this very unique perspective because the person who trained me, he was piloting a new training program. And so I was like his star pupil student, you know, like, yeah. let's see if this works. And he worked for Stephen Covey and ran Stephen Covey in Mexico. And so he brought me in with this already, this mindset coach type of perspective. Like if yeah. I would say, well, I'm new which a lot of my clients say, by the way, this is a thought that holds a lot of people back. This thought I'm new or I'm learning and yeah, have right. been learning for three years, but they haven't taken action. Um, and so overcoming those mental hurdles to get into it. And I, I just rose to top 10 within a few months within the company because I was fearless. Like I was willing to just put myself out there in a way that I think youth really allows you to do. And so that training for me, um, 
understanding how to show a home, how to sell, how to sell from service. Like it really is just, you are helping people. You're helping them with something that they need. You're providing that. And that I think is, I'm so grateful. His name is Steven. I'm so grateful to Steven for mentoring me and training me in that way. I think hiring coaches and having um, this you know, perspective from someone who's done it, who knows how to read people, who understands how to sell. Oh my gosh. I'm so grateful for it. Yeah. Do you think that because of the, I mean, to me, like it's, it becomes a much easier sales cycle when you have products that you really believe in. So when you work for a company that's selling something, whether it be new homes or widgets that you really believe like this is high quality, you can go with that passionate base to make sales more easily because you're just telling them what you believe. I find it like really like when I think back to people like door to door selling like bad vacuums or something like that's, <laughs> That's like you, you almost feel like that's where the used car salesman, you know, quote mentality mm -hmm. comes in. Mm -hmm. Have you felt like that helped you along the way? Even now, like when you're trying, you know, looking for clients for coaching or clients are coming to you when you believe in what you've done and what you're putting out there, it kind of makes the sales portion much easier and much less like sales. Yeah, absolutely. Um, about that, let's see about sales. I there really is this element of just serving people, remembering them, asking what they need that I think that just feels so heart centered to me. Yeah. And so that's the perspective that I love to come from for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that really it is it's service and paying attention. Not every person's going to be a sale, but they could lead you to 10 other sales. If you just, you know, ask the right questions and be a regular person instead of like always trying for a hard sale, which is tough for investors because a lot of investors are taught to just like really hard line sellers to get properties. But like, I've never been like that. I like the long haul. How can I help you? And if you, you don't know where a seller is going, you're certainly not buying their house. So. Right. That's so good. We part, my husband and I partnered with someone um, that we were making an offer together. We were doing a joint venture and they pushed it so much past where I was comfortable with. And we lost the deal because of it. Yeah. And, you know, a deal that I've wanted, I think because when you keep the person at the forefront, like you don't lose deals no. because they see you and you really see them. Like I feel really passionately about this just in my life overall. It's so important that we see people. These are human beings with lives and desires and outcomes that they want to create in their life. And when we can honor that and really see it not as a transaction, almost by any means, like most of my people become friends for life. Yeah. Well, I mean, I love what you're saying because what, what you're talking about is really a coaching mindset and mindfulness, which is what this was based around the mindful approach to real estate investing. I'm also a certified life coach. And like I always say, it wasn't like a, a weekend class. It was a 36 week um, intensive. And I think that helped me in real estate so much, but it also helps me team building, working with sellers, trying to find the right deals and being like a, a mindful person. And like you said, in the sales cycle, um, I don't like to do it the other way either. That's why I don't have a lot of partnerships because it's just so hard for me to match that mindful uh, personality. How did you eventually get into coaching? And then we'll, we'll also get back onto your investments and your agent business. Yeah. So for me, finding coaching was actually more of a personal journey. I was a stay at home mom in postpartum. My marriage was having a really hard time at the time. Um, I was feeling pretty worthless and I talked with myself in a way that was not kind. Yeah. Like I had this way of just being hard on myself, um, pushing myself to do more, but in a way that was like just caustic. And so I, that was creating anxiety and other things for me. And I, there was a day when I was standing in my living room and I had tried getting on some anxiety medication that didn't work for me. And I said, someone has to have figured this out. Someone has to have figured out how to live with yourself. Because yeah. if you're not safe with you, you're not safe. And when I know what that is, like when I find it, I will do this with my life. I will help people be kind to themselves. Yeah, that's amazing. I do find that probably 50% of people in life coaching programs are there to help themselves first. And then it helps them transform to help other people, but it's a great way to kind of get yourself out of, like you said, 
uh, kind of a negative spiral or one that you can't get yourself out of the bad negative self-talk can ruin anything. Even as we take that to investing, I think that's like what you said before, people can spend three years, you know, working on getting started, but it's a negative self-talk that won't let them just take the one step. You know, what are they going to say? Are they going to say no to me? Well, yeah, everybody says no. What are you going to do after they say no? Yes, absolutely. And if you bought the property, let's just say worst case scenario played out, you buy the property. A lot of people feel like this is, we had the, this is my one bullet mentality with our down payment. We're like, this is the one bullet. It yeah, yeah. Go right. Or I don't know, the world will fall apart. Yeah. And when you know how to feel negative emotion, and when you know how you're going to talk with yourself and treat yourself after, if everything went to hell in a handbag, right? You are now safe with you and you're able to take such bigger risks, wise risks, but like you're able to think so much bigger and go so much bigger when you're safe with you, no matter what happens. Yeah. That I mean, changed my life. Yeah. Educated risks are great risks because they're just, you're betting on yourself really. And like you said, you can't get to that point unless you've built up the confidence to be okay. I mean, everything is a risk, but like real estate, you always still have the land house could blow down, still have the land, you have insurance. So you're like much more protected than investing in other assets. And I try to tell people that, you know, a lot of investors, you know, like we all have financial advisors, financial advisors are like, don't invest in real estate. It's not going to make any money off real estate, but like we're experts at real estate. So why wouldn't we put it in there? It's tangible. I can touch it. I can rent it. I can live in it, you know, as opposed to a stock, which just exists like, you know, in, in the air somewhere. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting to see how we help coach people to look at the asset that's actually right in front of them. Like that, right. it's so interesting. If you go back to your background, you know, your first purchase is $1,000. It's a mobile home, but you went in and immediately touched it and transformed it. And that's what I think real estate does. You don't do that with other things. You can make money on a stock, but it's not really like, you know, I don't get any like visceral reaction from that. I, I like it. <laughs> But I don't be like, oh, wow, look, it looks so much better. It's the same piece of paper, mm. you know, that exists in the air. So true. And I wanted to say this about when we were talking about selling before, yeah. um, about when we, okay, what you're really selling in a lot of real estate, like for me as a realtor was really selling myself, meaning my ability to deliver for you. This is kind of that self-employed quadrant of I will figure it out. I will make it happen. And I think when we have that view of ourselves, that like, no matter what happens, I can figure it out. That resourcefulness within us and problem solving ability and confidence within us, there is uncertainty in the world. We can't control everything as much as we would like to, but when we know I will figure it out, I, I feel like that's just such a helpful mindset to come from and something that really makes it feel like I can promise people things because I know who I am. I know what I will deliver. Yeah. And I, so I wonder if you think this, I mean, in coaching, the hardest thing is not necessarily to get people to buy into us, but to, th- to get them to do the work because they almost have like a resistance mm-hmm. to doing the work. So a lot of times as coaches, we're just saying like, Hey, you said you were going to do X, Y, Z and you're doing like not even X. So you can't really tell us that we're not completing it. How do you get people to get that mindset to follow along? And have you have you seen people, especially investing coaching, struggle with the first step of starting to do, you know, the work to get there? You know, I think first of all, because I'm so action oriented, I think I tend to attract people who do what they say they're going to do. But when we don't, there's I'm never looking at just like as an accountability partner. That's not how I work as a coach. So I'm looking at what is behind why you didn't take the action. Like what is the core belief that you're running your life by? That's like your unhelpful power sentence that is running your life. That's having you not take action on this. And when you solve that, it flows into every area of their life. I love the saying business is a healing modality. Um, And that's really the perspective that I approach it from. Yeah. I feel like it's an unlocking mechanism, what you're doing. And like once a client yes. can unlock the one thing that you just help them get through, then there's like a cascading effect of like, wait, wait, now all the rest of the stuff makes sense. So that really makes sense to me because you're taking the one little pin block that they didn't even know was it, you remove it. And now it's like, wow, they can see again. Here's, here's the futures out there for them. 
Yes. And that part is so rewarding for me. Like I've had clients, I had a client who couldn't, she was an entrepreneur. She couldn't make money in her business. And I've, she was one of my very first coaches and I didn't pay her. She was free. Um, and like eight years later, she came to work with me. And in one 15 minutes of a session, when we found out the thing that was, there was a core, I would almost say it's like a trauma, right? It's a, this is where the deep dive coach portion yeah. comes in, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like understanding that we have neural nets in our mind that we try and avoid touching those parts that, that locked up part of us where we don't have access to all of our knowledge because we experienced something that was um, an emotion that was bigger than we could handle. And that's really what creates a trauma. And then the trauma becomes the neural net in our minds. Well, if you can go unlock that piece, you're now freed to create in the way that you weren't able to before. And so it can be a very short amount of time, but it's very deep work. It's subconscious work. And I, I don't feel good for me, like as a coach, I know that I want to be able to handle anything my clients bring, meaning I can meet you anywhere. We can go anywhere. And I, because business is healing, I feel like that's a vital part of what I do as a coach. Yeah. I love that. And I think it's important that, you know, real estate investment coaching does involve life coaching. Like I don't think mm -hmm. any coaching doesn't involve life coaching because it's all a product. Most of the roadblocks are coming from our life. Like you said, it's not yeah. like you're not blocked by the numbers. You're blocked by some, you know, negative modality in your head about why you can't, you know, be, get more than this, you know, for an investment or do this. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's so important that, you know, especially as you look out there in the landscape, there's a lot of real stuff and a lot of fake stuff out there in all aspects, you know, of the world. You look on social media. I don't know what's real. You have to meet the people and really understand, you know, feel from them. You know, are they really in it for the right reasons? Because definitely not everybody is. Um, mm. What's your journey been like through agent to coach and what gives you the most satisfaction out of helping other real estate investors now? you know, do what you learned to do starting at 14? Oh, that's such a good question. So as an agent, I pinpointed the portion of the process that I loved the very most, which was I would show everyone all the, all the, I, we would walk through all the homes and then the couple, if it was just a residential purchase, yeah. the couple would say, okay, we'll discuss it and get back to you. And they would say, okay, we decided this home. And I always wanted to understand why we do what we do as humans, why we show up in relationships with you, what motivates making that decision. Why that home, not another one. That was my very favorite part. And also sometimes understanding like the beginning from the end of what they wanted to create and their, their decision wasn't always in line with their long-term vision. And so I basically pinpointed that one exact portion of the process that I loved and made it my entire job. Right? So when I sit down with someone, we look at, where are you? Where do you want to go like 10, 20 years from now? What's your retirement plan? Like what's your generational wealth and your legacy? Yeah. And what actions will you take along the way that will create that for you? And then I just get to help them align, right? Everything that's blocking them from doing it. And the doing becomes so easy. So of course, yeah, they report back to me on what they did, but I really believe in my clients resourcefulness. Like I don't want to be their accountability partner because I believe in them so strongly that like you can do anything you set your mind to. And that's my job is to hold that belief as the coach of their infinite potential and coach them from there. That's so different than therapy. Like I'm yeah. taking people who are already have functioning lives and being like, you are spectacular. You just don't even see it yet. Let me show you in real estate right now in this moment. Here's how it plays out. Yeah. That's nice because sometimes I think the accountability part is really like the belief on our end that they can do it, that that's what they need more than like, Hey, you said you were going to do this Friday at two and you didn't do it. Cause sometimes the failure of not doing it makes them feel worse. Whereas it like, Hey, right. just make sure you do it at two fifteen. you know, like you have to get it done. You said you get it done. That's what's going to be, but I believe you can get it done. And I think like, I really hear all the mindful principles and what you're saying, which really like works very well with the entire core um, behind the podcast. In terms of investing, what has your investment portfolio looked like over the years? Do you still invest or are you just coaching? What does it look like on your end and what type of investments do you like the most? Yeah. Oh, such a good question. Definitely still investing. Um, it's for hard me, not to. It's so much fun. <laughs> it's so much fun. And yeah, it sets you up for success later on in life and even right now. So um, with my investing, I 
it still take it doesn't take all of my time. I think that's important for people to understand. Like being a full time investor, it you just you can do it, but you can also do it as a as a side gig. Yeah. And for me in investing, I have done so many different things. Like I feel like my strength is optimizing a property. So I look at this property and I have the knowledge of everything behind it, all the different strategies I could use and creativity comes in where you're like, okay, I have this piece of land. Now it could be turned into this, 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 or this, how, which one is going to put it at its highest and best use. And of course yeah. that will return me back money. It will serve the people in the community the best and everyone wins when we do that. And so that's led me to do ground up development on, um, 60 doors and then oh, wow. another awesome. ground up development project with 16 doors. Um, in each of those, I kept several of the properties. Um, we built garages in that. So that's like the development side. Um, I've done burring, flipping, um, just like pretty much any <laughs> strategy I've done. I have not done Airbnb because it's hands on more than what I want to do. Yeah. And right now it's in decline, in my opinion, anyway, because so many people got into it. So like just for anybody listening, now is not the time to be a first time Airbnb landlord. It's not a great time right now. I'll tell you what I love. Um, I love commercial properties that are triple net. Yeah. Meaning it's that's this is when we get into mailbox money, right? Yeah, yeah. Properties and I love not national tenants like Starbucks or whatever. Those are fun, but yeah. they don't return to you as well as like a break shop. Yeah, yeah. Or a doctor's office. And one of the specific strategies that I especially love, and I think this could be helpful for listeners if they're wondering what to do. Um, I love sale leasebacks. So where the seller wants to yeah. sell the property, but they want to continue as a practitioner there. Like one of them that I own is a doctor's office. You said well, specifically on commercial, right? Specifically on commercial. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a doctor who wants to continue working, but he would just like the cash infusion, he wants to go um, use the money for something else. He's going to immediately have a discount. He's going to have to bring the property to market at a discount because an owner yeah. occupant is typically who will pay the most. And so you already have a tenant in place. They already have an established business there that's working and you get a discount on the property as well as having the property guaranteed for the next five, 10, whatever the lease is that you negotiate. So I yeah. love that specific strategy and I love the control that comes within like I've done syndications. Um, but I love owning the property because you can predict an emerging market and you can get in and you can, however long it usually would take 10 years to appreciate you can yeah. shorten that to three years and then and then you could choose to sell or to hold either one but understanding market cycles and understanding um basically just how to create the most money per dollar is really fun yeah one other strategy oh go ahead yeah so so i mean you also talked uh, about finding highest and best use and you also talked mm -hmm. about you know, multiple uses. And we always say like, you definitely need like a backup plan on every property. And what you're saying, all the investments that you're talking about, there's always a backup plan, a flip. If it doesn't, if it's not ready for sale or the market goes down, we can just rent it, hang on to it for a while. Maybe it's not optimal, but we're not going to lose money. You know, commercial uh, buildings have so many different, I love mixed use just because you have residential and commercial. Yeah. And it's like, you just have a diversification inside one property. That's yeah. so interesting. So I love that. What was the last one that you were going to talk about as well? Okay. So first, um, about that, I love the more forward thinking that we can be the better. So when we, when we buy a property, I'm thinking about what are my exit strategies? And I think a lot of new investors maybe don't know to think that way. But um, I, I just love that you hit on that. The last perspective of what I think, this is where the most creativity comes in. Um, I want to tell about a property that we bought. So we bought it off market. It was several tracts of land. And we ended up doing sort of like the um, selling some to one builder, some to another builder, keeping of one piece, one of the, what's it called? The subdivision, what is it called? Just one lot for ourselves and then negotiating with the builder to build us a property at cost. Yeah. And then we keep that. We use the land as the down payment. So it's no more money in. And then we have cash flow every single month. Yeah. So that, that kind of thing. Like when we get into land plays, we are bringing in a lot of creativity, a lot of fun. 
it's more risky, but can have a huge payoff. Like that property we put in 220, we got out 320 eight months later. Like yeah, that's nice. was 320. That's insane. It was insane. <laughs> that's the yeah, uh, best deal I've done. I loved that one. Yeah, but that, I mean, that shows like diversification across the board to me is like the, what I think of as, you know, an investor or investor coaching. Like if you're just good at one thing and in investing, you, you are the type of, that's the thing that can get caught when there's a market downturn. You know, if you're all apartments, all syndications, all multifamilies, like, are you safer with real estate? Sure. But I like to do all of the different things because I think it helps you learn more as an investor. It's cool to be an expert in short term or midterm, but like, I'd still rather branch out and have some other options um, along the way as well. Um, So how how do you, where do your real estate uh, investor clients come from normally? Where do you find them from? Where do they find you? So a lot of them are just from in person. Uh, I just, I like, I'm going to best ever conference. I don't know if you're going in three weeks, but I'm the biggest introvert ever. I seem like I'm not, but I am. I have to go to BP con in October to be on a panel, but, uh, I haven't been to best ever, but maybe one of these days, if I go to conferences, I am there for a little bit and then I immediately go to my room and don't come out. So wow, yeah. I think you're the opposite though. I'm the opposite. I go to conference. <laughs> I'm on cloud nine because yeah, I love yeah. all the people and understanding them and what's your journey and where are you at and how can I help you? And so, yeah. have you that, been on, have you been on best ever on the podcast? I haven't. I haven't. Yeah. Oh, well, they got to get you on there. I was on during the pandemic, right when the pandemic started, they had me on there to talk about the pandemic. Oh, um, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be delightful. Definitely. Definitely going to put that one on my list. Um, but yeah, I am like smiling so hard. I can hardly talk. Um, I, I just love people. And so I think for me, it's not, it doesn't feel like finding clients. Like yeah, yeah. when you speak from your heart about what you do and what you're passionate about, and this is in any industry, like people find you, people are drawn to you and they just love working with you. They see where you're headed and they want, they want the transformation in them. That's what I find with my people is I'm ready. I want to do something big. I want to find out what I'm capable of. Yeah, I think that's another great point. I mean, I think just, again, like I was saying before, you really want to find the people who are real. And I think if you're paying attention, you can really tell, especially in person, you know, like, does this person have a passion to help me? You, I can tell just, I mean, I can see you now, you know, through Riverside, but like you have the passion to help people. And that's how people will get that vibe. And then they take it on themselves and they can move it forward. Like you can't be coached by someone who doesn't have that because you're not going to, they don't want to get there. How are you going to get there? Yeah. And I think for me, my client, my clients winning at this point is way more exciting to me than me winning. I know I can win. Like I actually have enough money that I don't have to keep working. Yeah, I love watching my clients and I love seeing the self-concept shift in them becoming yeah. an investor and the confidence that comes with that and how they show up when they believe my money is in demand and I can make an offer to someone that will help them and also benefit me. Like I, that self-concept shift for me is, I live for that. I love that so much. Yeah. And that's a giving nature. I mean, that's just wanting you. It's like, feels better to see other people succeed, especially when they're new. I love when, you know, seasoned investors succeed too, but they're like us. They're like, well, I've done that before. Like, great job. But like watching someone, especially when their mindset shifts from, I don't know how to do this to, I do know how to do this. That's, that's the thing that can go from, you know, eight to 80 or whatever they want in terms of units pretty quickly. I have a fun story about that. One of my clients had, she'd only been working with me three weeks. We've had three appointments, but I had taught her where to find the properties, what she, which type of property um, we had uncovered that together. And then she had understood now how to use the deal analysis calculator that I have. I built one that I just love because yeah. it's like the sweet spot. And in 10 minutes, you can know if this is a, you know, let's move forward a thumbs up property (laughs) or like a not interested property. And she texted me or uh, she wrote me in Slack and she said, I, at my lunch break, I analyzed two properties. And one of them, I was like, nah, I'll wait. And the second one she was interested in and for her, like experiencing that to know with surety, yes, this is one good one. And no, I will, I'll hold off on that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so fun. Yeah. I think that's delightful to me. I think the no part 
is even more important because I think like some new investors are so charged up to become an investor that like the first thing you throw on their plate, they're just like, this, this works. You know, when somebody tells me like, Hey, this deal has been sitting on the market on market for 360 days. And I, I think it's like, you know, one that everybody missed. And I'm like, you think that every investor in the area all passed on this deal and you think it's a good deal for you as a first time investor, but they're like so hungry to get there that almost the confidence to say, actually, that deal sucks is really interesting to be able to see them do because that's the step that will get them to better yeses is to be able to say no. Yes. It's so interesting because I feel like the people who I work with, and this might just be because I tend to have a perfectionistic nature <laughs> and an indecisive nature. And so maybe I kind of draw those people to me, but they tend to get stuck in analysis paralysis that like, um, well, how do I know which area? How do I know which um, type? How do I know yeah, if this yeah. is the right one? What about, what about kind of forecasting what might go wrong? I feel like that's often where they find me. And really my perspective is you can be making an offer within 30 days. And I think for me, the, the, at least personally, the desire to continue on a property that's not going to work is in due diligence. Yeah, like yeah. when you get to the end of that due diligence process and you know, this isn't the best deal. Sometimes it's hard to let it go because of this. We think of it as sunk costs, right? This is yeah, where the yeah. mentality comes in. Yeah. You're like, I've spent 50 hours on this and paid for all the inspections. I don't want to let it go. I just wish it were different than it were. Yeah. And I think that's for me where I see the emotion coming in is a little further along. And that's the time that absolutely you need a coach to help you. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, you just, buy it. you just said an important thing, which I wanted to touch on before. It's the emotional attachment to real estate, especially for new investors. You get that. Like you said, it's a sunk cost fallacy plus, well, like this was my baby. It's my first property, but like emotional attachment will kill you in real estate. I love all my properties that I've ever had, but I will sell them in a second. I don't care. My personal residences, you know, sorry to my kids, we've moved a lot, but like, that's the, I grew up that way. Like my dad would say like, we would, we'd get the best house. We'd get it all the way we want. And we'd have all the stuff. And he's like, we're selling. And I'm like, this oh. is dumb. Why are we doing that? And he'd say, well, we're making this amount of money. I said, that sounds great. Just get me like a basketball. Like, I don't care. Like I started to understand the profit nature. And it wasn't that you can't be emotionally attached. It's that there's, there's a time where you have to part with properties, but it is hard. Like you said, you put in 40 hours vetting a deal only to realize it's bad. If you keep trying to put, you know, the square peg into the circle, uh, it's not going to, it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. And I, we've never really had deals that didn't work over a long period of time, but a lot of people who come to me have, they say, I own this property and it's like barely breaking even or not even. Can you help me? Yeah. Um, Awesome. There's a couple of things in the um, in the um, information that you gave me before that I wanted to touch on, because you said that you find a lot of people who are indecisive that come to you. And then so one of the things that I've always said is that I find that a lot of people who are indecisive or stuck in analysis paralysis, they just haven't seen enough properties. You know, even if they were in want to invest in, say, another market, they still need to go out and see properties. But you said the most important trait for a real estate investor to have is decisiveness. Explain how you get someone there, because I think that's part of your coaching that changes their mindset. Sure. Well, I think when we make decisions, when we make powerful decisions, we release our power into the world. Like everything good that comes to me comes to me when I make a decision. And so I know from personal experience of there was about three years where I think we had like $170,000 to invest and we had all these different, we looked at a hotel, we looked at a gas station, we looked at um, regular multifamily and I didn't take any action. And it was really once I began just moving forward on something that I knew was a good deal. Like, of course it has to be on the right property, but yeah, yeah. But you can create your deals with your offers that you make, right? I, I'll often say it was advertised at this cap rate and your numbers actually show this cap rate. I'll yeah, make you a deal exactly. at the advertised cap rate. Like that's yeah. a brilliant way. That's a due oh. diligence thing though. And I think in commercial, like yeah. it's always there, there's always stuff left out of the box and you can create the cap rate, like you said, that is realistic and show them. And then they're kind of like, yeah. okay, okay, got me. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I think it's when, when we're in maybe, and we're in indecision, it is miserable 
I've experienced this in my personal life. I'm going through a divorce right now. And like being in that, maybe, I don't know. Yes, no, is so painful yeah. versus like decide either way. And either way that you decide, you'll know right away, was that the right decision or not? Like, was that a decision that I'm, I'm glad about or not? But you move forward. And yeah. the faster that you can have these feedback loops, feedback, fast failing loops, like I watch the people in my industry grow and the people who grow the fastest are the ones who just take action, take action, take action, take action yeah. and are willing to fail and have their back when they do. Because you can always pivot. I mean, I think people like yeah. the fi the finite nature of a decision. They think like, well, if I decide it's going to be yes now, it has to be yes forever. And, you know, mm -hmm. just like you referenced, like some people will stay married forever because they just think like, well, I said I was going to do it. So I have to do it. You don't have to keep a property for 30 years just because it was the one that you like then. Even if you have to sell something at a loss, I always think like, hey, I'm still going to get the down payment back. So you know, every investment's not going to be a hundred percent, but somewhere in there, like you said, you have to make a decision. If you just hold it, something eventually is going to go wrong. Might go right, might go wrong, or nothing may happen. And you'll be in the same spot 10 years from now doing the same exact thing, which is a waste. But it's the emotional suffering that you experience that I think, I think that's the true tragedy, right? Is when yeah. we're in indecision about this property, this area, um, I really do see that that's what I keep bringing my clients back to is like, what exact decisions do you need to make right now to move you forward? And yeah. that's where their power is. I just see it over and over. Um, and what you were saying about the properties, I love, I'm an expert at reinvention. So I look at every property every year and I'm like, or multiple times a year and think, would I buy this again today? Yeah. And if not, like it's time to sell it and move on. And I've bought and sold a lot of different properties. Like people see my investing as active. Like that's what yeah. <laughs> I, I like tell my accountant that it's passive. And she's like, well, you bought and sold so many this year. And while I want that cash flow in the long run, yeah, it's being willing to up level because I see people getting stuck at good in their life. Yeah. We are yeah, so yeah. pacified and satisfied with good, a good enough relationship, a good enough property, a good enough return. Yeah. Versus really being willing to trade it all in, like to put all the chip, to burn it all down and yep. to be like, I'm going for great. And that's yeah. my growth. Uh, I love it. Good's boring to me. I want it to be great. I mean, every day can't be great, but why wouldn't I want to try my best to make everything great or at least put the pieces there to make it happen? Um, mm -hmm. One other thing that I really like from um, this. One thing that makes uh, you a great guest for this podcast, you said, I see real estate as art, which I love. I was also in the art world for six years and I'm a big like person obsessed with aesthetics. Like you said, you're revisioning yes. what properties look like. How do you v view real estate as art and what does it mean to you in that context? I think I feel the same way. I've always looked at it as art and I think that's a different mindset than most real estate people. I think that's so true. So I remember I used to love to paint and draw and it was like on a piece of paper. And one of my mentors said, <clears throat> I was like, she was like, you need to think bigger. I'm like, oh, like, like a four by five. <laughs> like a four <laughs> by five foot. And she's like, no, no, like bigger. And I didn't get what she was telling me at the time. But like, to me, art is like, it's the clothes that I choose to wear. It's like, it's, it's creating my life. Like I'm the curator of my life. And I think the same thing in real estate, right? Most people, I find this with my clients. It's they want to buy something that they would want to live in, which yeah, is not yeah. really a good return. <laughs> and no. we can't, I don't mean art as in I made it look perfect. Yeah. I mean art as in I have this money to work with. And there's a whole world of opportunity and possibility. And like, what am I going to create with this and how fast can I create it? And how, <laughs> how much can I transform these properties? And so that to me, it's like a much larger scale art of my investing and me as an investor and my portfolio. Maybe I see that as like my portfolio is my art. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. And I always think like flipping is its own art form because that yeah. really is an open canvas to design what you want. Um, I usually, I, I flipping maybe one or two at a time, but it's just, although it's always annoying, I still love it because the transformation of a house is just so interesting to me to watch take it from something that's not attractive to something that people can come in and say, 
wow, how'd you do that? And then you can teach them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I haven't done as much flipping as I would like to do. It's that's almost like a pet project for me. It's like yeah. something that like brings me internal yeah, yeah. satisfaction. Um, and I will say about that, I, I did do a duplex in Utah um, two years ago, made 80 grand was the profit, which is incredible Yeah, in nice. uh, eight months. But it was, it was so entertaining. Just as a fun side note, I'll tell you a story. Yeah. So we got into it and we knew that there was some type of mildew or mold or something. We didn't really know, but it <laughs> was fun stuff. Well, it wasn't, wasn't cat pee this time. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, right. uh-huh. Ooh, I don't know. I don't yeah. know which one I'd prefer. <laughs> But we had to strip the entire bathroom down all the way to the studs, pull out. And, and as they were working on it, uh, the bathtub fell into the basement of the nice. property. And, okay, I cannot even remember where I was going for that. But I just was like, yeah. are you serious? They sent me a picture of a hole in the floor. And that was deferred maintenance at a deep level that's like the true slumlord experience and for me to go in <laughs> and like transform that from literally unsafe yeah yeah who i bought it from the i got a call when the remodel was done and the tenant said she was crying and she said i can't even ever thank you enough for transforming it with their bathroom she was like i we have a place to live this is my home and i just i'm so grateful you're my landlord yeah and for me watching the bathroom go from super ugly to beautiful i mean i put i over improved it for sure yeah. i liked her <laughs> well, I mean, exactly it was like because gift. you can and so that was one experience where like yes sometimes it does actually look beautiful after but for me it's not even about the aesthetics it is but it's about the people yeah like, her life is different she is more safe her lungs are better like because of what i did and so yeah. that impact for me and legacy is unmatched yeah i think some people for, forget like not every property has to have a philanthropic nature but you can be philanthropic in the way that you invest in parts or in whole. You know, there's Mm -hmm. lots of different ways as a landlord, you can either be a great landlord who appreciates their tenants and wants them to experience what home feels like, or you can be a slumlord and nobody likes slumlords. A lot of us, you know, have problems picking up the pieces that they've left before. So just by providing rental homes that are like upgraded and and valuable to people, you are doing a great service because it's not easy to find affordable housing. So it doesn't always have to be the million dollar flip or the, you know, the huge profit that it has the biggest impact on you. Um, I love that. Um, as we close up, where are the best places for people to find you? I found you on Instagram, so I know that's a good place. And that's at Alyssa Holbrook. No, yeah, yes, Alyssa, Alyssa Holbrook. Holbrook Coach. Yes, yes. that's right. Um, so yeah, Instagram and then LinkedIn is the other one that I'm pretty active on. And I believe it's just Alyssa Holbrook. I should have looked that up. Yeah, it looks like it is. But they should be able to find you on there. Uh, pretty easily on LinkedIn. Uh, One question for you, like I like to ask at the end, if you could give new investors one piece of advice right now in today's real estate climate, what would be a piece of advice that you would give new real investors right now? Awareness is so important. If you can understand why you do or don't do what you're doing, that is that will transform your life. And, and when you have that awareness, also understanding that you can create anything that you want. It's about shifting and choosing thoughts on purpose that, because if you think about it, wherever we're at, like, let's say I'm making 20,000 passive in real estate, or I'm making zero passive in real estate. The thoughts that you have are creating that result in your life. And so we, I have to burn down my thoughts. I have to trade in those thoughts. And it's like trying on a new shirt or whatever, trying on new thoughts of who you are as an investor. Not that you're new, right? That, that you're learning, that you're here, that you're, you're beginning, like you've already started. And there's a difference between I will do so. I will be a real estate investor and I am a real estate investor. Yeah. I am successful. I own a million dollar real estate portfolio. No one can tell you not to believe I own a million dollar real estate portfolio. 
Like yeah. you can believe that and then live yourself into that day after day after day. And inevitably the thought that you have will align with the result that you want and they will come together into one and you will be that person that you want it to be. You just gave our listeners a mini coaching program <laughs> right, <laughs> right there. So if our listeners want to get coached by you, Alyssa, where's the best place to go? Should they go Instagram, LinkedIn to find out about that? You're good with DMs. It's so cool because like, uh, most of my guests I talk to on DMs and I feel like DMs has really become like a much more regular way to communicate these days. Yeah. DMing is great anywhere. LinkedIn or Instagram are the two main. Um, also, you can just type in Alyssa, A-L-Y-S-S-A, -S -S Holbrook, H-O-L-B-R-O-O-K dot A-S dot M-E forward slash consult call. And you can literally just book an hour with me and I will walk you through where you are now, where you want to go and what I see to be your mindset and also tactical, practical skills that you need to get from A to B. Yeah. Awesome. I'll add that final link into the notes as well. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's great to get to know you and I look forward to us staying connected. It was great to get all, you really embodied the mindful approach to real estate investing. So I'm glad that we connected and I could get you on the show. So do you, this is such a good fit. So thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. It was my pleasure and I'm sure we'll stay connected. This has been, here we go. Episode 34 of Zen and the art of real estate investing with my guest, Alyssa Holbrook. We'll see you next week.